this week on Make Better Wealth Decisions, how to laugh at death and taxes. Make Better Wealth Decisions, a podcast that explores how financial advisors' blind spots can harm your investments. I'm your host, John DeGuy, a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. In this podcast, we'll provide advice on how you can achieve better outcomes by maximizing investments and minimizing taxes. Let's put our thinking caps on as we consciously decide to get smarter about our money. I'm speaking with Barb Amsden, and we're talking about some frequently asked questions, things that you need to consider with regard to your estate planning and the old phrase, what's up? That's a seven letter acronym that Barb uses to help you go through the process of planning for your own estate and making sure all your assets are in order. Stay tuned. Make better wealth decisions. This week on Make Better Wealth Decisions, we're speaking with Barb Amsden. Barb is the author of a book called How to Laugh at Death and Taxes, a book about estate planning for Canadians. It takes a bit of a humorous and lighthearted look at uh, a very important subject and something that we all need to think about as we make better wealth decisions. Barb, how are you today? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks very much for having me uh, on this podcast. It's uh, it's great to be part of a, an independent reviewers show and to be able to really focus on what's important to Canadians. So that's the thing about make better wealth decisions is that usually you think of wealth decisions as being managing your money while you're alive and making the most of what you've got. But your book is going to be something that I think is often overlooked. And it's a bit of a taboo thing that a lot of people don't like to talk about it because it seems a bit morbid to some people, but it's vitally important. And that's estate planning. So if we're making better wealth decisions, uh, one of the best things you can do, one of the best decisions you can make is to have a current and accurate up-to-date will that reflects your wishes. And there is a lot that goes into that. And I know that you start your book with a number of FAQs, some frequently asked questions. What if you could maybe walk us through some of those questions and maybe even hold up a copy of the book if you've got it handy? Absolutely. Here is a copy of the book. So uh, what you can tell from the book is that it does have a bit of humor to it. There's nothing funny, of course, about either death or taxes. However, sometimes you do have to uh, have a little humor to get through some of the, the difficult times. Um, so the book came about because of the challenges I've had in managing my godparents' estate. And so I felt uh, as I was going through it, and that took four years to get through an estate that was very simple. There was no real estate. There were no beneficiaries quarreling. There was no complexity at all, but it really took a lot of, uh, a lot of work. And that's why uh, in, the, in the, your discussion or the, your description of this as estate planning, it is not estate planning in, the, in terms of choosing how to make the best um, financial decisions or the best tax decisions. It really is about how to plan so that uh, you are able to pass on what you want to whom you want, when you want. Uh, and if you, it is also to help uh, people decide if they want to be in the executive or not, and also uh, to see if you're a, going to be an heir or, and for a beneficiary, you've got some things to learn as well. And so from all three perspectives, it is really a question of understanding what needs to be done at the right time, using the right professionals at the right time, and keeping on. And the original title of the book was Keep Calm and Carry On. Right. So we're, uh, there are three main uh, legs to the stool. There's the testator, the person who writes the will. You've got the executor or the executrix, uh, depending on the gender of the person who is going to be overseeing the disposition of the assets. And then you've got the heirs, usually plural, uh, who will be receiving the assets. And all three of them uh, work in concert in, in one way or another. I'd like to ask you to maybe walk people through what goes into being a good executor or a good executrix and what a person who's writing the will should be thinking about before naming one. Well, that's those are the key questions because it is this three-legged stool and there are supports from other, other uh, people and, and professionals, um, but it really gets fair to choosing that executor and the executor uh, should not accept the role if they don't have a little bit of an understanding of what it means. Uh, as well, the executor can actually help 
manage the wheel maker so that the wheel maker understands and can make better decisions as well. It's not just something that is once and done. It is efforts that begin early on in terms of the will. Once the will is done, the executor is going to have an idea, but not necessarily, will not know the contents of the will in most cases. Uh, and so they have got to be prepared as well to carry out what the will maker wants um, once the person has passed away. So the key thing is, from a will maker's perspective, is, is the person the right person? And that is so often not the case. I'll give you one example now. I think we talked about examples. We'll give some as we go through. There's one case where uh, there's a brother and a sister. Um, both are uh, beneficiaries of the mother's estate but only the brother was named the executor. And one of the key things is that the executor must ask, act fairly for all the beneficiaries and not um, take any advantage for themselves. Well, in this particular case, the brother, whether because he doesn't know enough about managing his day or not, he did not tell the bank, the financial institution, that the mother had passed away. And this causes all types of, of problems because Money from the, the uh, mother's RIF continued to come into the account, which should not have been happening. The account was joint with the brother only. And so that was an immediate cash benefit for the brother, although I don't necessarily think that it was his intentions. So it really has to be carefully thought out, both in terms of does the person have the right skill set, but also what are the, some of the potential downsides if a particular person is chosen? You could use somebody who's a financial advisor or even a lawyer. But they may not be the best people if they don't get along with the other people that are going to be part of this whole uh, inheritance process. One of the other aspects of estate planning is powers of attorney. And a, a POA, a power of attorney, is a person who can step in while you're incapacitated, either physically or mentally or for whatever reason. And so when you're alive, your POA speaks for you. And when you pass, your last will and testament speaks for you and, and allows your executor or executrix to carry out your wishes. Now, that can be a little bit dicey if the person who is your POA, your power of attorney, is also your executor. And I don't know if that's exactly the circumstance that you were describing in the story you told a moment ago, or if it was just happened that the RIF account was somehow set up to being paid jointly. But Maybe there's a story you can tell there about the risks of, of uh, being a bit too cozy with one person. Um, absolutely. Uh, so in this particular case, um, the son did not have the power of attorney, but he was joint account holder on the mother's kind of banking account. And on the, some people know, others don't, that having a joint account with somebody is, is one way of avoiding perhaps probate taxes uh, because on the death is for normal joint accounts on the death, the um, full amount of it would be passed to the other joint account holder. Whereas the sister would think that that really should be going as part of the estate to be shared equally amongst the brother and sister. Um, so absolutely. And the other thing is the skill set for power of attorney for a person who's a power of attorney, whether for financial affairs or for healthcare or personal uh, situations, aren't necessarily always the same skills. Um, and people that are powers of attorney don't know that, in fact, once the person dies, the power of attorney ends and it is the executor and the will that take over then. So I, you're absolutely right. You have, it's not just enough to think about who's the executor. It's also to think about who's got power of attorney. And one of the things that you make very clear in the book is that the testator should do everything in his or her power to make it easy for their executor or executrix to do their job, which is... Where are the account numbers? What are the passwords? If there are specific items that you want passed, to, passed on to specific family members, maybe you could itemize them by taking pictures and, and finding ways to make it very clear about what your intentions are. Because I think there's, it's just natural that you, when you're writing your will, you know what you mean, you know what your thoughts are, but it's just natural to use language that is at least somewhat ambiguous. And then it's up to the executor to figure out what did she really mean when she said this, because yeah. sometimes the wording is open to interpretation. And, and oftentimes, a lot of the disputes that we hear about with regard to the division of assets in an estate, TVs and movies would have us believe it's usually warring siblings that are out to get millions or tens of millions of dollars from this whatever. Usually, it's just people that are 
you know, mom always wanted you best, or mom told me that I could get the China set on, on my 20th wedding anniversary, but that was 20 years ago. And since then she's, you know, whatever. And then there are these simple disagreements about oftentimes very small things that cost exponentially more than the value of the asset, but because they have sentimental value, they get involved. So perhaps you could offer some counsel as to how we can avoid those ambiguities to make sure that, that the executor or executrix can do their job with as little fuss and muss as possible. So that, you have uh, really hit upon something that could be the, actually the basis of an entire movie, book, uh, whatever. And I should say that my mother, um, first of all, my godparents, their estate, that, which is the one that led me to this, uh, was extremely well planned out. All the information was available and so on. And they had a great financial advisor that, that helped me go through when I was having to help manage the will. The other thing, though, is my own mother, she had tried to uh, ask us what of her property was particularly important to us and that we would like. And we refused to tell her because, of course, it's all about, I don't want you to die and so on. And um, so it's, as a friend of mine would say, it's, you know, it's time to put on your big boy plants and really deal with the issues, the ones that are going to be problematic. And, and frequently amongst this, you'll find the family cottage. And I know a couple of stories related to family cottages, I'm sure you do, which take a lot longer to, um, to deal with. And I, so I think, um, it is makes sense to ask people what it is that's important to them. And so that at least you've got a couple of things that are clear and in advance, because it's the surprise that causes some of that hurt. If after the fact, somebody else got what you think you're getting. Um, yeah. And it, it is, if it's important, a lot of people, there are other people that would say though, I'm dead. What do I care? Figure it out yourself. I guess. If you love your children or whoever it is that your beneficiaries are going to be, I think it behooves you to to offer as much clarity as possible because then they're going to start getting into this, he said, she said, and what did you really want? And notwithstanding the fact that it seems morbid, it's in fact, as you say, an adult thing to do. We all die. It's, uh, you know, death and taxes. It's uh, Those are Ben Franklin's two inevitabilities. And so yeah. we can... In order to be able to laugh at it after the fact, you should you should be able to uh, hopefully plan properly along the way. Which brings us to uh, something that you have, uh, I think, in Chapter 8, you actually go through uh, a little, uh, I like uh, acronyms as well. So you have this lovely acronym, WADSAPP, W-A-D-S-A-P-P, the seven steps of estate planning. And yes. I would love it if you could maybe take a moment to walk us through each of those seven steps, what the letters stand for and what's involved in the process. I would be pleased to do this because when we were going through this estate the, with my co-executor and I, the lawyer involved gave us a three uh, page printout of a bunch of lines of things. These are what you're going to have to do. My mind is a little more, I can't, I've got to get organized because I've got so many things I can go in many different directions. So what I came up with the WhatsApp, but at that point I was thinking of the Bucks Buddy WhatsApp doc. And, but however, nowadays for the younger generation, it's like WhatsApp. So what uh, the W of WhatsApp stands for the will. And it's really about it. The order of the letters is more or less in the order in which these steps may occur. However, one of the things, uh, and in the book as well, there's a picture which kind of looks like snakes and ladders. And that's exactly what managing will is like, which is you move forward and then all of a sudden you kind of slide back down and have to re-go over something because, oh, somebody didn't give you the right birth date or somebody didn't sign a piece of paper. Um, or you find out that the house that you think is in the name of the person who's deceased is actually in the name of their husband who had passed away already. So the, it's the will. There's other documents such as the uh, uh, notarial and the probate certificate, which is about uh, guarantee, well, proving that the will is legitimate and so on. There's also things you need to find, such as the pre-planned funeral documents. Uh, so one is, again, that's that paperwork, and that should be straightforward for the will maker to have together in one place and able to pass on straightforward in a straightforward way. Second is, again, common sense. It's, it, I use the A as advise and advice. So the advice is you've got to let friends and family know you need to contact the lawyer because you're going to need to get the will, assuming there is a will. That You're going to need to get that notarial certificate that says that as far as that lawyer is concerned, that is the last will and testament. 
you are going to all let the government, different government offices know in particular the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, and you're also going to have to let financial institutions know in almost every case. And that could be fun in itself if the person has several accounts in different financial institutions because they will all want different things in different ways. The part of the advice is you can start looking for people to help you that you would, these are professionals. And so that would include to start with the lawyer, but also pretty soon the financial advisor, it could be the tax advisor and so on. The D is dispose and this is dispose of, um, most people don't know that in fact, if you are the executor, it is actually your responsibility to dispose of the body. This to say that in most cases that will be handled by a family, but you may be part of that family. However, it is also important that if somebody wants a destination funeral and uh, the uh, will does not have enough assets to cover that destination funeral, you as the executor has to step in and say, no, sorry, you can't do that. We've got to make sure Mr. Taxman, the CRA is paid off first. The S is a secure and safeguard. So it's, it's kind of common sense, but some parts of it really were beyond what I'd expected. So secure means that you have to make sure that any of the assets are locked up. A house is locked up, that there, if you're, if nobody's going to be living in the house, that there is insurance and that there is coverage for it and so on. And the safeguard is you have to do things, including maintaining the value. And that's where your financial advisor is going to help in a big way. So I know a lot of people have lottery tickets as their planned uh, retirement to back up plan. The next one becomes, so we've done the WADs. The next one is app. That comes from account four. So you've got a set of accounts and you've got to track um, payments in, payments out. You've got to track deadlines and make sure they're adhered to, particularly in the case of, again, the CRA. And you also have to make sure that you are reconciling as you go. So that money coming in and money going out is going to still give you with the balance of the account that is going to be what you distribute to the event beneficiaries of the heirs. The first P, because there's two P's here, is probate. And we talked a little bit about that. It's where it is proven that the law, the will is the final will uh, and that there hasn't been undue influence such as, uh, I hadn't wasn't aware of this, but there's a lot of a second spouse who late in the day is they marry and then there's a whole bunch of problems within blended families for this. So it's proven it's a final will. And then it gives the executors the power or the authority to act. Uh, it's also pretty much required for all financial institutions, unless it's the first bus to die and you've got joint accounts and stuff like that. It is also going to be a company by a probate fee, as some would call it probate tax, but that is really more, it's not an estate tax. It is it's for administration, although it can be an add up to a big amount. And then the final P is for pay and payout. So paying the taxes paying off any outstanding debt or loans, and then finally paying the heirs and the beneficiaries any remaining money. There are things that you can do along the way. For example, you can get rid of household goods, but that's really the overall process. What a lot of people don't realize is that on the day you die, as far as CRA is concerned, there is a deemed disposition at fair market value of whatever it is that you owned on that date. So if you have securities in your RIF account or in your taxable account and they're worth X and then the market moves, there can be some problems if you don't dispose of those assets, especially if things move downward. So I can tell you of a story that I heard going back about, um, I guess this would be about a quarter century when, uh, when uh, Nortel was the big thing. I heard a story of a person who died who had a million dollars worth of Nortel shares. And they didn't want to sell them because they were told it's a concentration risk problem. You need to diversify. You need to start taking some profits. It's now making up 70, 80% of your portfolio. And the person who passed said, well, I don't want to sell all this Nortel because my adjusted cost base is really low and I'm going to have to pay all this tax and I want to pay this tax. Therefore, I will defer my tax liability indefinitely until I die. And then it will be a problem, you know, but I'll have this massive estate and it'll be no problem. The person died. And there was a delay in selling. And at the time, Nortel was starting to tank. And so this is in a taxable account. And so there's a tax liability based on the deemed disposition at fair market value of Nortel shares that are now worth something in the seven digit range. By the time they got around to selling it, there was not even enough money in the estate to cover the taxes for the deemed disposition. 
much less distribute uh, money to the heirs who were expecting a sizable sum, not not a year sooner or, or earlier, right? And things change. And if you don't, it's, 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 what's the saying? People don't plan to fail. They just f fail to plan. And if you don't think about this, and sometimes this is an, an example of the executor or the executrix not being on the ball and not moving quickly, these are the consequences so that sometimes fall out of that. I had another story, which I'll get to, but I, your story is very good. And now it's true that the executor isn't really responsible for if the market tanks. Right. However, if an executor moves slowly or doesn't engage a financial advisor that is going to, you know, carry through and say, oh, putting everything in this or putting 80% even in this one basket is not a good thing, then the executor could become responsible and uh, could be subject to lawsuits. In my case, uh, and this was with my godparents, and my godfather died late in the year. And um, so anyways, we had hired a tax a person and who was, had been their tax person to complete taxes. And probably just about two years into the process, we received a note from CRA saying we have $90,000 in undeclared income. What is this? And even though the tax advisor had been their tax person for quite some time, because it was near the end of the year, the actual risks hadn't been collapsed. And so he didn't uh, see a tax slip and obviously had forgotten that in the case of death, it has to close as at the date of the death. Um, so we ended up having to pay, or my godparents, who I'm sure would have shopped and rolled in their graves, ended up the, the estate had to pay $45,000 in taxes. Um, that it, it's, it would have worked out the same way, but it was just something that should be well known for people and planned for. So the end of the book has a chapter called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And I think that would, might be an example that people don't realize that if you die and you have X number of dollars in your RIF, uh, then as far as the government is concerned, you withdrew every last nickel from that RIF and took it as taxable income in the year you died. And it will all be taxed at your top mar well, it'll all be taxed at marginal rates, which if it's a large amount, will, will be a substantial amount, maybe more tax than you've ever paid in any one given year while you were alive. And uh, people might not realize that. So that's the ugly. Uh, I'm hoping you can maybe tell a good story or a happy story or a humorous story as we start wrapping this up, just to sort of talk about, we're going to laugh about this. So maybe maybe something we can laugh about with regard to estate planning. I'm gonna, I'm think of something. Do another, another bad one very quickly first, which was, okay. uh, as I'm sure you probably have another podcast on this, the whole change with the capital tax rules that could make it much more costly in terms of when you actually do dispose of things. It, what worked out really well was my godparents' financial advisor was excellent. Um, and she could give me a, a really good sense as to how long does the CRA take to do this? And she kept very detailed notes. So when my godmother, who had no financial experience, and my godfather, who had dementia, uh, were put by an advisor into a principal protected note, which I know that you'd be very familiar is not the right thing for somebody that is 80, that are in their late 80s. This woman had kept detailed notes, explained what it was, and enabled us and helped us to get back the money that should have gone back to my godparents. The other source is of help was the your MP, strangely enough, your member of parliament can be helpful. They can inquire into why it's the CRA taking so long. And as well, the CRA actually went out of their way at a couple of places, the CRA staff, to help me out. The only thing I would say, it is that is a good, but it also could be a bad if you um, don't know how to deal with the CRA on a particular issue. So again, would recommend going with the, an advisor, qualified advisor. Perfect. Okay, so let's wrap this up here. I always like to end with my guests giving some advice about what they would counsel people to do to help them make better wealth decisions. Barb, what advice do you have there? Okay, so I would have to say that I, giving me to, limiting me to one was very difficult, but I did choose one, which is most people think uh, they get their will done, everything's great, uh, but in fact, you need to review that well. And my husband and I went to Jordan and Egypt uh, this past fall, um, and as we were going and our friends were questioning, are you sure you want to go there at this time? Um, this was just in late October. We went over our will for the, I mean, we'd said we should, and we had looked at it a couple of times, but we changed 50% of the beneficiaries of our estate for a bunch of different, you know, legitimate reasons. Some didn't need it anymore and so on. So I think is, uh, the other thing we realized is we have got uh, executors that are more or less the same age as we do. 
So we really need to start thinking about changing our executors to ones that are younger. And finally, it, there are there were some of the yeah. beneficiaries that really we felt that there that it could the money itself could go to the next generation down rather than keeping it sorry go to two generations down instead of just to the next generation. So I would say it's really important to review that. Well, and also things change. So your um, people get remarried, and there are a lot of situations where things change, and it's really important to keep that up to date. Great. Well, life happens, and you have to be thinking about how things are changing all the time. I updated my will two years ago, and I know after speaking with you that I already have to update it again. And so I'll be working on that later in 2024. So, Barbara, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed this. John Degui is a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. The views expressed in this program are not to be construed as specific advice. It is recommended that you consult a qualified advisor before taking action. His books, The Professional Financial Advisor 4, Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry and Bullshift are available through Amazon and in bookstores throughout Canada. You can reach John at 647-STAND-UP. That's 647-782-6387 or at jdegui at designedsecurities.ca.